Everest is called the top of the world. Thousands of climbers have climbed it, but not all have come back alive. Everest is a place where nature is hostile to the human body. We're going to tell you about the main events in the history of Everest and how far people are ready to go for the sake of their dreams. But before we begin, make sure you've subscribed to the channel and hit the bell icon to stay updated with future content. And as usual, the longer you watch, the more interesting it becomes because the most surprising things always show up at the end of the video. Everest is the highest mountain on Earth above sea level. Its official altitude is 29,031 feet. The first successful ascent was made by New Zealander Edmund Hillary and Nepalese Tenzing Norgay in 1953. Since then, there have been many routes to Everest Peak, but two are considered the main ones, the northern route from China and the southern route from Nepal. Each has its own peculiarities. The most popular south route begins at the dangerous Khumbu Glacier, whose huge ice flows move down every day, breaking into pieces. To pass the glacier, people fasten ladders between its crevices and count on their luck. The chance of falling into the abyss is still high. Sudden avalanches, earthquakes, and hurricane winds that can knock you off your feet are also frightening. The weather here is very capricious. The scorching sun can be suddenly replaced by a cold snowstorm at temperatures as low as minus 76 degrees Fahrenheit. The higher you climb, the more dangerous Everest becomes. The low oxygen content in the air causes the heart to beat faster, increasing the risk of a stroke or heart attack. Many are exposed to mountain sickness, which has two serious complications, cerebral and pulmonary edema. The area above 26,000 feet is called the death zone. There, the body starts to lose strength with no possibility of recovery. The problem is solved only partially. Firstly, climbers take oxygen cylinders with them to breathe, and secondly, they acclimatize, that is, gradually adapt to new living conditions. The ascent takes place slowly, with intermediate stops and overnight stays in high-altitude camps. On average, the ascent, acclimatization, and descent take two months. It's impossible to do that without helpers. For this purpose, people hire indigenous people, Sherpas. They carry heavy things, oxygen cylinders, fix ropes, set up tents, etc. Initially, only a few trained athletes climbed Everest. Then, the flow of people increased. The Nepalese and Chinese authorities started to make money by selling permissions, that is, permission to climb. In addition, foreigners needed services, food, lodging, and transportation. All this ensured jobs for the locals. In the 1990s, four profit companies emerged that offered rich clients an escort to the top of the world. The cost to join an expedition started at $40,000. The price included oxygen tanks, permits, guides, Sherpas, cooks, and much more. The desire to earn more money in competition between companies brought to Everest completely unprepared people. Queues appeared on the way to the summit, thus increasing the risk. One day, clients and professional guides were trapped in a desperate situation that made its mark on history forever. In 1996, there was no shortage of people at the foot of Mount Everest, with several expeditions planning their ascent. The crowds of people and the abundance of tents were like a rock festival. On May 10th, there was good weather following a strong wind. More than 30 people, including 14 clients of two commercial expeditions, started simultaneously to assault the summit. One expedition was led by Rob Hall, while the other by Scott Fisher. The ascent was slow. The reason was that on two difficult sections, the safety ropes were not fixed beforehand. The guides had to fix the ropes while everyone else stood and waited. So, a queue of people appeared at the ropes. The ascent was very delayed. To get back to camp before dark, the descent had to start no later than 2 p.m. But probably because of the competition, Rob Hall and Scott Fisher didn't turn people around. Both wanted to make a successful ascent. Once the clients did make it up Everest, they stayed too long, taking pictures and admiring the views. With all the delays, the last climbers began to descend after 4 p.m., and by 6 p.m., the weather had already deteriorated sharply. The sun changed to a snowstorm with a hurricane wind. Being in the zone of death, the expedition members lost their way, and soon they ran out of oxygen. As darkness fell, the situation became critical. Some fell without strength, some went blind, but still, some managed to find the camp and tell the Russian guide, Anatoly Bukhrev, about the clients freezing nearby. He went on a search in zero visibility, found the lost people, and helped three of them get back to the tent, thus saving their lives. 
The next day, they found out that the snowstorm had killed eight people, including the two leaders of the commercial expedition. Scott Fisher had frozen halfway to camp. Rob Hall stayed near the summit with an unconscious client and called for help over the radio for about 24 hours. By satellite transmission, the freezing Rob Hall was contacted by his pregnant wife. The climber could not walk and knew he was doomed. At the end of the conversation, he asked his wife not to worry and fell asleep forever. However, a real miracle also happened. Beck Weathers had been lying in the snow for about a day. He had experienced critical hypothermia and a coma, but nevertheless awoke, got up, and descended to the nearest camp on his own. The tragedy of 96 on Everest forced us to make important organizational conclusions, but despite all the precautions, accidents still happen. Sometimes people overestimate their strength. This happened to David Sharp in 2006. He was climbing alone in the most economical way possible. During the descent from the summit, he ran out of oxygen. Sharp sat exhausted at an altitude of about 27,887 feet in a place where the body does not regenerate even when resting. More than 40 people passed by. Some gave him oxygen, some talked to him, but in the end, after sitting for two days, Sharp froze. The situation sparked much discussion in the society. Why didn't anyone help him get descent? Ten days after Sharp, a wealthier Australian, Lincoln Hall, fell into a coma from cerebral edema at 28,215 feet. Four Sherpas left Hall in the snow, believing he was dead. A day later, one of the expeditions found the man alive. A team of 11 Sherpas was immediately dispatched from camp to pick up Hall. Thanks to the organized help, he survived. The stories of David Sharp and Lincoln Hall are similar in circumstances, but they end differently. The conclusion is obvious. In a difficult situation without money and a team, the victim's chances of survival tend to zero. Helping a stranger on an expedition means giving up on conquering the summit, so not all show compassion. Another danger to climbers comes from natural phenomena. In April 2014, a huge piece of ice fell off the slope of Mount Everest and landed directly on the Khumbu Glacier, causing an avalanche. As a result, 16 Sherpas died. A year later, also in April, there was an earthquake in Nepal and again an avalanche on Mount Everest. That day, at least 19 people fell victim to the disaster. It is important to note that not all the victims die dramatically. Some fall asleep peacefully in their tents and never wake up again. The highest mountain in the world has seen many records and achievements. The first woman to climb Everest was Junko Tabai of Japan. About halfway up, she was hit by an avalanche and remained unconscious for six minutes but was rescued and eventually she conquered the mountain. Climbing without oxygen tanks is considered especially difficult and risky. Previously, people thought it was impossible at all, but the mountain climbers Peter Habler and Reinhold Messner proved the opposite. They were the first who did not use supplementary oxygen when climbing Everest. One day, a blind American, Eric Weichenmeyer, climbed to the summit. His example was to show people that some goals that may seem out of reach are, in fact, quite achievable. Mark Inglis, a double leg amputee from New Zealand, proved the same point. The man was the first to climb a mountain with prostheses. The event was marked by something disturbing that many have talked about. Inglis' expedition passed a freezing lone climber, David Sharp. On the one hand, a disabled man who reached a summit is worthy of respect. On the other hand, he left the dying person alone and walked past. Another double amputee mountaineer, Chinese Zhao Buyu, decided to climb Everest at any cost. During the first descent, he severely frostbitten his legs, so they had to be amputated. He did not give up, installed prosthetic limbs, and kept going to his goal. Zhao Buyu came back four times without success, and only on his fifth attempt at the age of 69, he made his dream come true. By the way, there was a real fight for the title of the oldest Everest climber between Japanese Yuchiro Miura and Nepalese Min Bahadur Shurchan. They had climbed the mountain several times, one and the other being called the oldest Everest climbers. In the end, the title stayed with the Japanese, who climbed the peak at the age of 80. The Nepalese repeatedly tried to break the record, but each time he retreated. At the age of 85, during another attempt, he died of heart failure at the base of the camp. The youngest conqueror of the mountain was an American teenager, 13-year-old Jordan Romero. The boy went in a team with his father and stepmother. Society immediately sparked a debate. Is it worth exposing children to such serious risks? Soon the rules changed, and now no one under the age of 16 is allowed to climb the mountain. 
Extreme athletes set other records on Everest, jumping from the summit by a paraglider, skiing or snowboarding down the slope. It doesn't always end well. For example, Marco Sofredi went missing while snowboarding. People also marry on Mount Everest. It is said that such marriages, if they are not made in heaven, are very close to it. Every year, the number of people who want to climb Everest grows, which causes various troubles. In 2019, there was a traffic jam of more than 200 people on the way to the summit. The fact is that there is a short period of favorable days for climbing, a few days in late April and early May. As soon as the weather allows, hundreds of people simultaneously go on the assault. People stand in the cold for hours, losing strength and waiting for their turn to step on the roof of the world. Some achieve their goal, some turn back and go down, some die. Everest statistics are that for every 10,000 climbers, there are about 300 deaths. The evacuation of bodies, especially from 26,000 feet, is difficult, dangerous, and expensive. One more problem, the garbage left by numerous expeditions. Plastic bottles, cans, bags, torn tents, ropes, and human excrement are scattered in places where people often stay. Because of this, Everest became known as the highest garbage dump in the world. Recently, climbers have been obliged to take their garbage with them, otherwise they will be fined. The Nepalese and Chinese authorities are actively trying to clean the slopes of the mountain. Periodically, a team of cleaners removes tons of debris and, if possible, brings down the bodies of the dead. It's hard to say why people go to the mountains. For some, it is an opportunity to assert themselves, to feel self-confidence. For others, it is a lifestyle where the process itself and everything associated with it is important tense, nature, freedom, and risk. Probably, the goal is not to reach the peak of the mountain, but the inner feeling one gets when conquering it. Everyone feels something different, and it's hard to put into words what it is. You can only experience this feeling when standing on top, especially if it is on top of the world. We're curious to hear your opinion about this video in the comments. At this point, we get to the end of our video. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon and give this video a big thumbs up.